Okay, so we convene the meeting. Welcome everyone. Um, and we have um, folks here, distinguished guests from um, the Department of Consumer Protection and uh, the Department of Public Health. And as you know, today's meeting is largely to hear from them. Um, uh, and the first part of it will really deal with, you know, currently uh, the Department of Consumer Protection regulates the home care industry, and uh, they're going to kind of talk about what they see and complaints that they get and issues that come up in, in, in that process. And then I believe um, our friends from public health will, will try to provide a little more um, perspective on just what other states do uh, in regulating their home care industry. Um, so uh, without further ado, Leslie, I, I'll turn it over to you. I know Hi. Pam's on. Hi, Pam. Nice to see you. I'm attempting to share my screen now. Let's hope this all works. Let's see. All right. I think that worked. Does everyone see the screen? Yes. Go on. Wow, success. Just got to launch the presentation. Yep. Yeah. OK, well. Um, first, um, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Leslie O'Brien. I'm the Legislative Director at the Department of Consumer Protection, and I want to thank the task force uh, for uh, serving and also for the opportunity to share information with you today about homemaker companion agencies and DCP's regulatory role. Um, I'll be presenting today with two of my colleagues, uh, Pamela Brown and Wendy McQuaid. Uh, they, uh, Pam and Wendy, if you'd like to say a few words before we begin. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pamela Brown. I am the Director of Investigations Division, a division in which uh, regulates and investigates complaints and audits the Homemaker Companion Agency. We have a dedicated staff of um, two and a supervisor that does this work day to day, and that will be Wendy McQuaid, and I'll turn it over to her. Good afternoon, I'm Wendy McQuaid. I represent the state of Connecticut, the Department of Consumer Protection Investigations Division, and I'm the supervisor, as Pamela said, I'm in charge of the two special investigators that handle the compliance and enforcement of the homemaker companion agencies for the state of Connecticut. Thank you, it's nice to be here. Um, also, uh, please know that we will be happy, happy to answer any questions that you have at the end of our presentation. Okay, so I am. So, um, first, you know, there's a lot of confusion about home care in Connecticut, about the different services available for those who need some form of assistance to continue to live in their homes. I mean, there's just, you know, what is home care? Well, the home care industry actually doesn't just involve homemaker companion agencies. There is also home health care regulated by the Department of uh, Public Health. And so I just want to just make that very clear distinction because um, all of home care is not regulated by DCP. Um, and in fact, there's so much confusion. Consumers are confused. We even have confusion uh, with a lot of the homemaker companion agencies about what their scope is and isn't. Um, the confusion even involves you know, uh, what it means to be an employee in this industry. Um, state statutes, however, are very clear. And so homemaker companion agencies uh, are defined in state statute, statute as any public or private organization that employs one or more persons and is engaged in the business of providing companion services or homemaker services. And homemaker services uh, and companion services are also defined. Um, the um, um, also, there's a distinction between uh, homemaker uh, about registries and non-registries. So the law defines a registry as an HCA that supplies or refers individuals who provide homemaker companion services to clients. Uh, the clients are responsible um, for wages and taxes and or for providing tax documentation uh, to uh, independent contractors. Uh, the law also defines uh, employees as any person employed by or who enters into a contract to perform services uh, for a homemaker companion agency 
Um, and so that's important because, you know, in the traditional sense, we often think of employees as people employed by an entity where the entity is paying their tax, paying employment taxes and doing all of those things in that traditional sense. But in this instance, the statute actually includes in the definition of employees of HCAs, um, independent contractors, for example, people who are, or, or people who are paid directly by clients. Um, also, um, the law um, actually very clearly uh, distinguishes, um, in some instances, that there's a distinction between uh, companion services and homemaker services. Uh, companion services are defined as non-medical basic supervision services to ensure the well-being and safety of a person in such person's home. Uh, well, homemaker services actually, there's a little more meat to it. They talk about uh, providing, the definition includes providing um, um, assistance with personal hygiene, cooking, household cleaning, laundry, and other household chores. So, um, but, um, but the law is very clear that uh, homemaker, neither companion services nor homemaker services can include medical um, provision, medical care provision. So administering medicine, for example, in any form, pill or injection, uh, such as insulin is not um, allowed. Uh, providers uh, of HCA services can remind clients, you know, for when to take their meds, but they cannot assist with the administering of the meds or anything or any other provision of health services. And that is an area that we often see a lot of uh, issues with. So um, it's important to note. Um, HCA's uh, registration fee, uh, an application fee, the renewal is uh, annual and it's uh, $375. So an applicant must uh, also uh, pay the $375 and must also submit to state and national criminal history record checks and maintain either a $10,000 insur uh, surety bond or insurance policy. Uh, and like I was just saying, the annual renewal fee is also $375. Um, It's important to note here also that this registration is only required for businesses and not individuals who are employed by HCAs. Like I talked about before, that distinction uh, of what an employee is under the statute is, you know, someone who is also, um, you know, sent, uh, you know, uh, into a, a home, but not as the employee of the traditional employee of an agency, but someone who would go and work for, um, you know, a, a client directly. Even in those instances, um, the registration for those folks is not required, uh, just for the registry or the non-registry agency. Um, over the last five years, DCP has initiated several changes to HCA statutes. Uh, until the 2021 legislative session, the law required, for example, that HCAs run comprehensive background checks on prospective employees. Uh, in that instance, the problem was the definition of comprehensive background check was sort of broad and not very clear. And some agencies were running their own kinds of background checks through like a Google search or other search engines and were missing in some instances, criminal histories that uh, could be or were problematic uh, in this kind of work. Uh, so we requested uh, that the law be tightened up and uh, uh, that passed in 2021, and now HCAs must conduct state and national background checks for prospective employees. So that's a little tighter, a little clearer. Um, the law also didn't prohibit HCAs from hiring employees with certain past criminal convictions, you know, such as assault, sexual assault, fraud. Uh, there was no prohibition. So even when they ran a background check and found some criminal history that might be a problem, nothing prohibited them from hiring uh, those employees, and believe it or not, that did happen on occasion. So now the law is also, it's consistent. It prohibits certain uh, past criminal convictions um, from um, uh, from uh, being, uh, uh, from those folks being uh, able to be employed, or from the, sorry, from the HCAs being able to employ the, those folks with those kinds of histories. The, the prohibitions are consistent with uh, both DPH statutes and federal hiring provisions in the home care industry. So um, it tightens things up there as well. 
DCP also um, was successful in getting uh, the law changed to allow for HCAs to maintain insurance policies rather than surety bonds. So that's something I already talked about with the requirement for registration for, for up until recently, uh, only insurance, uh, uh, only surety bonds were allowed, but now insurance policies are also permitted. Um, and also um, up until recently, HCA owners and employees could actually act as power of attorney for clients, but that's now a prohibited act as well. Uh, based on our advocacy. There are also other uh, proposals that were enacted uh, based on advocacy efforts of others. Uh, in uh, 2019, the law was changed to prohibit the industry from using non-compete clauses with their employees, which had been an issue that the legislature had heard a lot about. Uh, after that change, some HCAs began to include no hire clauses in their contracts with clients so that um, uh, these, these provisions allowed HCAs to assess fines on clients who directly hired their workers um, after those workers had been, uh, you know, in the traditional sense, employees of agencies. Uh, that practice is uh, now prohibited based on a change made during the 2022 legislative session. Um, there were also uh, changes made in 2017 and 2018 to require more disclosure by HCA registries uh, before they hire, uh, were entered into contracts with prospective clients to make it very clear that those clients would be responsible for uh, tax documentation and payments for workers placed in their homes. Sorry, I, I didn't realize I wasn't on the right slide. Um, one of the proposals um, that uh, we had advocated for but was not enacted and we attempted to negotiate with the industry about, as Chairman McGolder can talk about too, is, is a, an issue about naming HCAs and what names HCAs choose to use. Uh, we see sometimes uh, HCAs that would like to um, use names that include the terminology like dementia care or assisted living or nursing care, which, you know, uh, is prohibited by law for them to, to provide those kinds of services. So uh, there's been a, a challenge with ensuring that uh, agencies uh, use names that don't suggest that they can provide health-related services. Uh, we looked for a statutory change to address this uh, uh, in 2021 and 2020 before the session ended because of COVID and we just couldn't get to an agreement on that on any language there. So that's something we uh, have been uh, struggling with and uh, still probably would like to address if there's a way to do so. Other advocacy groups have also attempted for several sessions to require uh, those employed uh, as HCA workers to get trained uh, and also to be registered with uh, DCP. Uh, so far, those um, those uh, uh, efforts have uh, not uh, been successful. So that's uh, pretty much my portion of the presentation. And now I'm going to pass the presentation over to Pamela, and I will uh, now uh, control the slides more uh, thoroughly. So go ahead, Pam. <laughs> okay, so the next several slides, we will cover some statistical data about our registration and employees, and then we'll go touch on some of the uh, out education and outreach. So this slide represents a 10 year look back of the total registered ACAs in the state of Connecticut. As you can see in 2012, we had 380. Now currently in 2022, there are 903. So definitely an increase in registrations over the last 10 years. This slide illustrates the, the registrations broken down by registry services and non-registry services. So you'll see we have more non-registry homemaker companion agency registrations than we do those who just solely work with registries and combined um, totaling up to the 903, uh, we also see that we have a lot of employees here. 3,591 represents the employees. We started capturing this data back in 2018, I believe, which is submitted upon renewal, and that has nearly doubled. 
The size of the agencies, we have from one to nine employees, 432, 50 to 100 employees, we have 100, and more than 100 employees, 89. So as you see in the previous slide, we had an increase in agencies, while here we show you that we don't have the same following with the staff. So in 2006, we had one full-time investigator. And as we moved along in the years, we now have currently two full-time investigators, a quarter time dedicated by a staff attorney, a quarter de dedicated by a paralegal, and half time dedicated by a processing tech. So we definitely could probably, as a director could say that we could create an entire unit on its own just to handle these cases. So in 2022, earlier this year, we did a consumer education outreach. Our target was really the underserved communities or the non-English speaking communities to educate them on how to hire homemaker companion agencies, letting them know what's available and also what they're entitled to through the, the services that they receive. So we did billboards, print media, uh, DCP websites, our social media sites, as well as non-English speaking newspapers. And this information is available on our website at portal.ct.gov slash HCA, and it is available in six languages. So according to the US census, the aging population in Connecticut above 65 and older is increasing exponentially. In 2019, we had baby boomers as the largest population, but now they've, they're ranked second because millennials have moved into first place. But as you see that we are projecting by 2030 to increase the aging population in our state. Further, this slide illustrates that Connecticut's aging population is projected to grow. And um, it looks like more than any other state as, or as a nation in, and as a whole, that the um, population of age 65 and older will grow in the state of Connecticut. And with that, I'll turn it over to Wendy. Hello again. Um, I will be speaking about the enforcement of HCA laws by DCP. I'll be speaking of complaints. I'll be speaking of the investigation process. And I will also be speaking of education and guidance for the HCAs. And that will be followed by the Q&A. So enforcement of HCA laws. Connecticut laws were implemented to promote aging in place. So these laws are in place um, to help people stay in their homes and keep them safe and protected and healthy. Um, currently, um, the HGAs um, here in Connecticut, um, they do provide services to tens of thousands of Connecticut's most vulnerable residents. Um, so with that in mind, we wanna keep in mind that the population that is served by the HGA is very, very um, vulnerable and in need of you know, the support that we provide to ensure their safety. The majority of the complaints that we receive are primarily about the business conduct, um, such as billing issues and service agreement issues, um, rather than health and safety. Um, examples include billing disputes, business practices, um, failure of the HCA to properly vet the caregivers, um, which include criminal background, um, a failure to um, ensure a complete and comprehensive criminal background check as mandated by law. Um, also, the advertisement by the HCAs of providing health services, as we spoke of, such as um, memory care, Alzheimer's care, nursing services. Um, this is a problem in the advertising that they advertise services that they cannot and should not provide by law. Um, also, another area of complaint is fraud. Um, vulnerable victims 
being um, per perpetrated by fraud, such as theft, um, credit cards, theft, et cetera, and also neglect. Um, some complaints um, arise from neglect of the client by the caregiver. Um, so our enforcement is focusing on the public health and the safety um, while ensuring a stability in the marketplace um, for the provisions of the HCA services um, that the clients and the families rely on. I mean, many of these folks, this is their lifeline, it really is. And so it's so important that the caregivers in place are properly vetted and supervised by the agencies. Um, almost all of our enforcement involves the private payer market. Um, those are the complaints that we receive. Like I said, billing issues are a big one. Um, we also want you to be aware that many HCAs are also providing services to meet to D DSS Medicaid funded programs. So these are not private payers paid through Medicaid um, process through uh, the Department of Social Services. My next slide, I'll talk about complaints. Um, any complaints that we receive must be in writing, um, typically email. Um, also because of this population, sometimes they come through US mail. So as long as they're in writing, um, we will accept the complaint and process it. Um, it's very easy process for them to just file it online um, at ct.gov slash DCP. Um, DCP receives complaints from clients, family members, employees, state agencies, as well as competitors. Other HCAs will often um, file complaints against their competitors um, when they see issues like advertising medical services would be a good example of, of that one. My next slide is going to talk about the investigation process itself. So if you take a look at this flow chart, chart very carefully, you can see the process illustrated um, fully for you. Um, we receive the complaints and I review the complaints and I will assign them to one of my two special investigators to investigate. Um, the investigation process um, is very thorough and very detailed and it requires a lot of, as you would imagine, deep research, deep interviews, and at times it could result in a complete and full audit of the Homemaker Companion Agency. Um, let it be known that not every complaint is going to result in an audit, but when we see problems, we're obviously going to address them and many, many times that will require a full audit of the agency. Um, we assess the violations um, based on the statutes and the regulations of the Homemaker Companion Act, and we determine whether or not violations exist. Um, the case could be escalated and referred to the legal division for further action. Um, it could be referred to law enforcement as well for potential criminal violations, or additionally, it can go to other state agencies as appropriate. Um, we can bring the HCA into compliance through cooperative cooperation and education. Um, that's our goal is to bring them into compliance through cooperation and education. Or at times, if we fail to obtain the cooperation and that, that we are seeking, it can escalate to a settlement agreement or a hearing. Um, both which may include a monetary uh, penalty. Next slide. Okay, um, we've been working very um, diligently and proactively um, to, I would say, reduce these complaints and reduce these problems at the start um, through education and compliance for the HCAs, which Obviously, it's a win-win for everybody, the agency, the business owner, their employees, the caregivers, the clients, and their families, and their support system. 
So we work um, with the HCA Trade Association and other stakeholders um, to educate and to provide guidance about the law so they can comply with the law when they know the law. So that's first and foremost. Um, recently, we've created a comprehensive advertising guide for the HCAs, and that's what you see in front of you. That's a picture of it. Um, you can find that on our portal, ct.gov slash HCA. We created this in six different languages. So it's available for anyone and everyone just by hopping onto our website. They can print it out in any language. They can have it, refer to them, and use it. Um, because we certainly believe that the education and the guidance of the HCA is our most um, successful remedy for um, avoiding problems. Um, so that's all I have. Um, we are happy to take any questions. Uh, we expect questions and we are happy to, uh, to answer them. Thanks. So thank you guys. Yeah, does anyone, um, you can raise your hand uh, if anyone has a, a question. Um, if not, maybe I'll just start with a question. Um, at the outset, um, you identified some of the budget constraints that have, um, you guys have been dealing with. Um, what, what do you think the, the greatest you know, negative impact of the budget constraint is? Um, is it a, a, um, an ability to kind of look into some of these complaints? Um, I think they said it was 21 complaints since 2021. Um, you know, what, what do you guys see as uh, the impact of the budget constraints? And I guess, what would you do with additional funding? Well, I'll just jump in first and say, uh, it's 49 complaints since uh, January of 2001 at first. Uh, and then I think the issue is that, um, you know, historically what's happened here is DCP, this registry requirement for HCAs was created in uh, statute in 2006 and implemented, I think, in 2008. And uh, the point is that when it happened, I don't think uh, the legislature anticipated the growth this rapid growth in this industry. And at the same time, obviously, uh, we had uh, severe budget challenges during many of those years. Um, so um, it made it uh, challenging to sort of start this uh, regulatory framework up uh, and uh, as everything grew so quickly with just one full-time investigator. Uh, and for most of the time the DCP has regulated HCAs, that's what we've had. Luckily, Another full-time investigator was added through the budget a couple of years ago, uh, which was helpful. But um, but that's I, the the industry has grown so much, uh, and you know uh, additional investigatory resources uh, 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 have are helpful, and you know more would probably be helpful at some point as well. I don't know exactly at this point what we need, but the the fact the fact that we now have two is 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 a, is, a, is a major improvement but we didn't for most of the time. And I would echo that as the director of the division, we have two, as Leslie stated, and we stated in the presentation, investigators dedicated to this work. However, in the graph we, we have seen earlier is that the numbers have almost tripled. And keep in mind that when we have the two investigators, they're looking at or try to look as many of the 903 registered HCAs as possible, but they cover the entire state and when they're doing audits, audit as a result of a complaint or a random audit, they're spending significant time in that business, maybe four hours, it could be a day or two. So definitely uh, staffing. And uh, Pam, I think you mentioned that um, safety concerns are, are kind of a minority of the complaints you guys have been getting. Um, are, do, do those receive a, um, a higher priority? Are they considered kind of more serious offenses when you're looking at um, at those? Well, Wendy, would you like to answer that? That was a part of your, your presentation. Sure. Um, of course, um, the safety would be the first and foremost. Um, oftentimes, uh, we do get complaints received from um, protective services from the elderly. And obviously, those are escalated um, to ensure that the client is 
safe as possible. And we would obviously look into that right away and contact you know, the agency to make sure that the client is safe and possible and perhaps with a different caregiver. Um, and then we also work with public health on those two. So we don't um, enforce quality of care, but we address these complaints um, immediately because of the safety is first and foremost of the client. Do you feel that um, there's any limitations like from a legislative perspective on your guys' ability to, you know, to do what you'd like to do um, from a compliance and regulatory standpoint? You know, is there anything that would give you more authority to um, deal with, uh, you know, bad behavior? Or is the regulation as it is written pretty clear on um, what your authority level is? Pam, do you want me to start with that? Sure, if you like. So a couple of things. I think um, one of the challenges is that we don't, and, uh, and this would require a tremendous amount of resources as well. Uh, so I, I say this without knowing, with knowing that that's the case too, but we don't have the ability if you have a large uh, HCA that services thousands of clients and there's a problem, we don't have the authority to like take, do a receivership, you know, uh, if there's a real issue there. So in, in shutting down, a lot of these agencies would cause such turmoil in people's lives that that makes it a, a huge, uh, you know, we're very mindful of of that on the one hand and on the other hand, the need to ensure public health and safety. So, you know, um, DPH, you know, uh, has uh, some legal authority with certain health agencies when there are issues, uh, they have research receivership authority. I can't remember, Jill, you can speak to that maybe if you, if you want to, when that's the case and when that isn't, but, but you know, but that's an issue, that's a challenge. Uh, we are lucky at this point that nothing has become that serious. But uh, should it, um, you know, we would have to, uh, we could be really putting a lot of families uh, in, in a huge uh, bind uh, if we have, if we ever have to resort to that. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Pam. No, exactly to your point. And not only the families, but as you can see, these agencies employ 34,000 people. So if you're shutting down an agency, you want to make sure you're, one, we, we could use the authority, but we're doing it the right way maybe putting some another agency in there to manage the people in place where they are with their current caregivers and just have uh, someone monitoring the day-to-day -day activity. Thank you. Any, any other questions um, for the folks from DCP while we have them? I think Sheldon had his hand up. Oh yeah, Sheldon? Yeah, hi. Th thank you. Um, so thanks for the presentation. A um, couple of questions on the complaints. Um, 49 complaints since January 2021. To me, given the stats you presented on the large number of agencies and employees providing these services, seems, I could be wrong, but <laughs> seems kind of small. Um, it, it seems like a relatively small number. At, I mean, but the, the charitable view of that, of course, is that it's because there aren't really that many problems. So that's why you're getting a few complaints. I hope that's the, the right answer, um, but it might not be. And a question, uh, first question is, how, how well known is this complaint process? Because what I've seen is that with various state agencies, it really varies how well it is advertised and it, that makes the difference. How, how prevalent, like, you know, some agencies put that on every single notice. It says right there, if you've got a complaint with any of these things, with any of these kinds of services, contact this number. Um, so that was the first question is how, how you know, how it's advertised. Um, does that, is that not a problem? Meaning that people just won't know about it. So that's why the numbers are small. Um, and the other questions were about just trying to, you know, I heard somewhat different perceptions on, whether you need more staff now, whether you need you know more than two investigators right now. And so I wanted to ask to try to get at that. Um, what is of the 49, let's just say, I mean, you probably don't have 
like detailed data on this, you'd have to uh, take some time to put it together. But just in general, um, of the 49 complaints that have been pending now or that were filed since January of 2021, which is, you know, 22 months, um, how many of them have been resolved? Um, and how many, how many are still pending? And maybe a related question, not just for those 49, but in general, how long does it take to resolve these? So if you can answer those questions as well as the basic question about the advertising, about the uh, complaint process, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so I'll start, but then I'll turn it over to Pam, Pamela and Wendy. Um, the, in terms of the status of the 49 complaints, um, um, we don't have right now our system, we don't have an easy way to sort of hit a button and generate a report, unfortunately, which we did. We're working on that. There's all sorts of things happening that Pam can speak to when it comes to how we're automating things more so that we'll be able to better generate reports to provide that kind of data. But uh, right now, you know, some of these are open investigations, you know, some are closed and the complaints were unsubstantiated. Some are, some were successfully mediated, you know, and some resulted in, in agreements, settlement agreements to bring the respondent into compliance. But I, we can provide you, we literally have to go into each complaint and pull that out and write a manual report to do that right now based on uh, the way the system has been programmed in, in, in the past, but again, it's something that has been a work in progress. But uh, so we can do that and provide that information after. Sorry, we don't have it now, but that's something we can, we're happy to provide um, as soon as possible. It's just someone has to manually go into each file to do that. Um, and then I, I think the rest of your question, Sheldon, can be answered by uh, Pamela or Wendy or both. Yes, so some of the enhancements that we, I should say challenges that we face is that uh, a current system e-license is shared by other agencies. So we can't just go in and flip a switch and say, this is what we need for the homemaker companion agents to make programmatic changes. It, it will, uh, for the boards that we work off, it's possibly that it could affect other agencies. So it takes us a little bit to get things done in our system. However, we are rolling out a few enhancements. So one of them, which is our uh, automation of our ABC program so that when the in investigator is out in the, the field or they're settling a case, they can go into our computer system and handle that complaint, process, process it to a resolution and issue an ABC. So we worked assurance of voluntary compliance. We worked with our legal department. Uh, we've got our, our document all ready to go. We just have to make system enhancements. Another enhancement we have is our mobile inspection app which as I said, when our investigators are out on site in the businesses, they, are, they actually have a, an app that they use in their cell phone. They're looking at files, employee files, client files, and they can go right through their checklist, have the office manager or the owner sign off on it and it's issued right to them directly before they leave the office. That will also interface with our e-license system, which is our main database that we use to track data. And so I think, Going forward, we will be able to provide uh, better numbers and, and perhaps uh, totals on our issues and natures to uh, provide you in a, at a later date. I, I think also Sheldon asked about, you know, sort of the average time it, uh, uh, it may take to deal with a complaint. I, I don't know that we can, I don't know if Wendy or Pamela, if you want to. I'll give that over to Wendy. She's a day-to-day. Supervisor. Okay. Um, the turnaround time on a complaint, it would be completely different from complaint to complaint. And as far as an average, you know, we, we turn these around as fast as we can. We work them basically chronologically, unless there's an issue, like we said earlier, of a person's health and safety, then obviously those would go to the top or something egregious. Um, we work them chronologically and they work very, very diligently. And the thing is, it starts out as a as, a, as perhaps like a minor thing, like a billing issue, which I don't mean to say minor, but something that could be resolved immediately, which they do. But as they dig into the case, they find all these other areas. Um, and then the case goes further and further. So to bring them into their compliance and to ensure that they are following the laws, the case 
will go on longer than you might expect because there's a lot of um, investigation involved to complete it thoroughly. So the turnaround would vary from case to case and it would be difficult to just put a number on it. They turn them around as fast as they possibly can. But again, with the two investigators, we're definitely short staffed. You also asked about um, notice. Um, how do they know how to file a complaint? Well, when they sign the service agreement with the agency, there's a place on there that they have to um, know how to file a complaint with us if there is a complaint or an issue or a matter of question. It has to be on the service agreement that they provide to the client. In addition, as we talked about, um, we've done a lot of grassroots efforts um, to get the word out. Um, we did complete that consumer guide in six languages, which is available on our website. And there's tons of information on our website and also um, the program that we also conducted to help those um, population that might not know about it with the grassroots effort, with the billboards and the radios and the newspapers. So we're getting the word out there for sure for the people to know what's going on. Um, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I did, you know, I am reluctant to ask Leslie to follow through on her offer, which is to go through individual complaints. You know, I wasn't expecting anybody to do that. Um, it's just that it's, it's what, what Wendy just said is sort of the, the crux of the issue is that with, with so few investigators too, um, it may be that it's really taking, it's a, a, an unreasonable period of time. It's nobody's fault, it's just the resources. And it would be good to know to what degree that is the case without going through individual, you know. So if you guys can sort of think afterwards, maybe think about how information could be presented uh, about that to help everybody understand this, it, it, it might be helpful. But thank you very much, appreciate it. Christy, did you have a question? I did, um, thank you. And thank you for your presentation today. Um, I just wanted to clarify, and I think you probably answered this, um, so you covered the question around how consumers know how to reach you, but I'm assuming given the resources and the way the guidelines are that you are just designed to be responsive, meaning like reactive versus proactive, or does your agency do any type of random checks on, on this, or is it strictly a response when a consumer calls with, with a complaint? We do conduct random audits and it's not reactive. It's very proactive as a matter of fact. Um, also, you know, getting the word out in like senior health fairs and so on and so forth. Yeah, it, that is completely one of our goals is to be proactive because obviously that will prevent a lot of problems by being proactive. And the key is education, 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 not only for the agencies, but for the clients and even for the employees, you know, to know what you need to do to comply with the law so that you avoid the problems. You know, sometimes we have found the agencies are just unaware of what they need to do. So a big part of what we're doing is educating them to avoid future problems. A lot of it is a lack of knowledge. So we're very proactive. That's one of our hallmarks. Okay, no, thank you for clarifying that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I wrote down, um, hi everybody. I, I wrote down a lot of local information and suggestions. And of course, I'm not gonna get to them today, but the first thing that I did address for um, uh, all this information was was what you just mentioned. And I thank you for it. Because I, I was wondering that the Department of Consumer Protection must employ hundreds of individuals. And I was wondering how many were dedicated just to the home care arena. And I'm sure you're all very, very frustrated yourselves because um, with our industry growing as rapid as it is, and it's up to, I mean, I, the last count I got was 889 agencies and now today it's 903. Uh, so somehow, some way we have to address this issue. But when you, when you it was duly noted by me that um, Leslie, Wendy and Pamela and the two special inv investigators plus attorneys, so on and so forth. So there's only really only five people 
overseeing our entire industry, which is growing so rapidly. So I think first and foremost, without question, uh, this is the biggest issue of all. And this is what uh, the policymakers should address first and foremost. And the budget must be increased because you just face an impossible daunting task to address. It's, it's mind boggling. Uh, Share ratio uh, 903 uh, to five, and then or 903 two as far as special investigators. Um, so that that in itself is is a great concern, of course. But I did have one other question, and it's not a major one, but because there's so, there is so much to discuss. Uh, on one of the slides, I, I it said that legislative proposals not enacted. Now the slide said would have prohibited HEAs from using words that suggest health services in, in the home. Shouldn't prohibitive have been allowed instead of prohibited because it is prohibited now. No, I'll, I'll just, I can just clarify that. Right now, the provision of health services is prohibited. And so, right, right. period. Um, we thought, because there were some HCAs that, uh, regardless of that prohibition, were using in their names words that suggested the provision of health services, even though it's prohibited. So when we were, uh, so we were trying to, we asked for language to tighten things up even more to, to clarify that the use of words that suggest the provision of health services are, are prohibited in the names of HCAs uh, because they can't provide the health services. So they shouldn't be able to use words that suggest they can. So we're still dealing with this and, and uh, Pamela and Wendy can speak to the fact that the there, we still address that, but it would be, we, we just thought it would be good to also very, you know, make it very clear in the statute that even the name should not suggest the provision of something that is prohibited by law. I understand. The thing, yeah, the thing is, we don't want to mislead a consumer into thinking that he or she would get services that we are not allowed to provide to them under the guidance of an HCA under DCP. In other words, we don't want a consumer to think he's going to get a nurse that's going to take care of him that's not going to happen or, you know, Alzheimer's care. That's not what this enables a caregiver to provide. It's again, simply the homemaker and the companion services. Nothing medical can be provided. That's another credential with public health. So we don't want misleading and deceptive advertising in the marketplace. And we want to make sure that clients are sure of what exactly they are going to receive under this credential. And also, if you think about it, it's, you know, protection for the agency itself too, that, you know, you're only providing what you can provide under this credential. If you want to provide more, then you would need to go to public health and get a different credential to be a home health aide, for example, then you can do that. But yeah, that, that is what we're working toward, yeah. Thanks. I guess I'll go next. I had I had my hand up, and then it uh, looks like Maria has her hand up. And I, I and I apologize, Wendy. I um I think I may have missed what you said um, when you talked about most of the complaints are related to business, not to health and safety. Um, did you give examples of what kinds of what you what kinds yeah. of complaints about business yeah. Um, yeah. and also some sense of when you say most, is that mm -hmm. like, you know, 51 percent or 99 percent or, mm -hmm. you know, what, what what is your sense right. in that regard? Right. OK, so when I say like business conduct, so the consumers complaints are typically typically. Um, I would say more than 50, less than 90%. I couldn't give you a number without counting, which I can't do right now anyway. Um, as far as uh, billing issues, um, 
not receiving a service agreement, overbilling, deposits, those kinds of things. Um, we see from a consumer's perspective more of those than the health and safety and neglect issues. We, we see more of those. Yeah, a lot more, a lot more. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I will be able to add to that, that with, it has shifted because I'm initially, I've been with uh, paneling homemaker companion complaints or involved in that since 2008 when it started, it seems like the shift is now towards business conduct and more so away from the neglect and the abuse and the exploitation or health and safety issues. Thank you. I'll just jump in with a quick question, which was very similar to Ian's really, <clears throat> which is from DCP's perspective, is there one primary concern that, that you do have about homemaker companion agencies right now in Connecticut? Were you able I, to hear me? Okay. Ah, all right. Yeah. I, I would just say this, I think, um, and it's why this ta I, we were very um, happy when this task force was, uh, uh, when the language to pass this, uh, uh, to create this task force passed uh, during the last session. The, the, the confusion about the different, the spectrum of services provided under the home care umbrella is probably, I, and I don't know if Pam and Wendy, if you would agree, but it's, it's a huge issue. And it's only going to continue to grow as the aging population in our state does. And the fact that it's so chopped up and we have, we have um, homemaker companion agencies and DPH has home health agencies. And by the way, then there's this overlay of Medicaid um, clients where DC, DSS is involved. It is um, extremely confusing. It's confusing for people who work for the state. So think about how confusing it is for, for consumers. It's it's confusing for a lot of the agencies, we, you know, uh, so um, which is why we work so hard to educate uh, them. So um, I think the real the, the real challenge as a state is, a you know, uh, that needs to be uh, thought through is, does it make sense the way this is all happening right now, all chopped up? Um, and whether or not, you know, uh, that is, you know, sort of the way this should continue. Um, I think that's a bigger issue, frankly, than, you know, um, a lot of the other issues that we've talked about. Um, not that those other issues aren't really important, but it's just sort of, you know, the vision of how this should work moving forward as more and more people uh, age and, uh, you know, and there's an emphasis on aging in place. Yeah. I don't know if Ham and Wendy yeah. um, I have something to add to that. I, and I agree with what you're saying 100%. There's another angle to this. Um, so one thing that I have seen and noticed is an HCA and the client um, at, at start point, everything's great. You know, non-medical homemaker companion, everything's great. They develop a great rapport with the client. Everybody's happy, family's happy, everybody's happy. Now, here's the problem which you HCA owners can see and tell me about is that what happens is as time goes by, the client's health degenerates and it could happen very rapidly. And in the meantime, they have this wonderful rapport with this wonderful caregiver, but now the services that they initially signed up for and that are going smoothly, it's not enough anymore. So maybe they don't want to lose the great rapport with the caregiver who's fantastic. So then what? So then additional services come in to help the person when they really need a home health aid, which is not us, that's DPH. And this could happen, you know, quickly. And so that's a problem too. Like it starts out great, but then it can deteriorate because of the client's health. And then they need more services, which cannot be provided by the HCA. So that's a problem faced by everybody, us, HCAs, clients, caregivers. 
So that's a problem. That's that knowing, I was, to, knowing when to escalate this, the services to yeah. a home health agency. It doesn't mean that the ACA has to be removed, but knowing when to talk to, you know, maybe make a phone call back to the office, meaning the companion or the homemaker, to say this person is beyond you know, what we are able to care uh, to provide as far as services, then we might need to have them or speak to a family member about bringing someone else in. Yeah. And that's related to some of your complaints and it sounds like that point of when to stop or enhance services really with medical services. Well, we don't really see it as a complaint. It's just something that we see as kind of a trend eye opener. We really haven't maybe not seen that as a complaint, just to okay. clarify your question. Okay. Thanks. All right. Any anyone else with um, a final question or two before we let us have a couple of quick questions? Have, have any agencies uh, in violation in the past been brought to the hearing level? Uh, and also, uh, in what form of uh, discipline? Uh, disciplinary action is usually taking place against a uh, an agency in violation. Has it ever escalated right to the top where there, there is literally a hearing level? Because I believe that's involved in the uh, assurance of voluntary compliance. It, you know, for that to be enforced, it has to be what to a, a public hearing. That's true, right? Uh, I'll just, just answer. Of the 49 complaints, what we're going to do is, again, get back to you with the actual uh, deeper dive data. We don't have, as we've already talked about, it's a shortcoming of the way the system is sort of built for all agencies and the way it has been and the data has been input into our system. We can't just generate a report like that. We don't have the ability right now. It's something we've been working on. And uh, it will that will change, luckily. Uh, but right now, um, that's not the case. And so, what I, what we what we're going to do is, with the 49 complaints from January till now, we're going to give you a deeper dive response. We'll have to again pull it and give you this manually of the status of those complaints and if they were closed. You know, you know, um, whether it was you know the number of unsubstantiated the number uh, that were, you know, the result it resulted in some kind of settlement agreement, et cetera. So we will give you that, but I can't, we don't just have a way to generate a report that says number of ABCs or, you know, number of unsubstantiated complaints. It's just not, unfortunately, the way the system at this point works. Okay. I'm guessing that a, a, um, a certificate has never been a revoked uh, due to a very, very serious uh, violation or repeated violations from an individual agency. Has that ever occurred once where you literally had to revoke someone's certificate of registration? Uh, to my knowledge, it has not, but then I would, to be accurate, I'd like to have time to look into our database. We're going back to, uh, we, our presentation is based on a 10 year look back, but this actually started with 2008. So we'd have to, to look back into our system for that number. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Leslie and Pam and Wendy, for your time uh, and your presentation, which I know took more time, um, <laughs> and answering all the questions. Um, so now I think we will move on to uh, DPH, Jill and Barbara, if you guys are ready. Good afternoon. Jill, do you want me to start? Yeah, I'm, I'm sharing my screen here. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. I'll start with introductions while Jill pulls up the screen. I'm Barbara Cass. I am the retired branch chief of healthcare quality and safety. I said that really quick, didn't I? Um, but back on a temporary worker retiree status, and I also say very happily because I love DPH. I am here today uh, accompanied by my incredibly smart and talented colleague, Jill Kennedy, who is a health program associate who I am privileged to work with every day. 
Um, we have oversight in the healthcare quality and safety branch, four sections. And one of those sections is facility licensing and investigation section. And in that section, just for some institutional history, um, we have about 2000 licenses with healthcare uh, institutions across the healthcare sector that range from outpatient clinics to end stage renal dialysis, home health agencies up to hospitals. Um, so there are almost 25 plus different provider types. Uh, we are going to start out our presentation with just very factual information and statutory language that does define and give us scope in FLIS as we refer to the facility licensing and investigation section regarding uh, home health care agencies, home health aid agencies, home health aid services, and in that um, continuum of care is hospice agencies. So starting out with home health care agencies, they are public or private organizations. Uh, they do provide services that are available 24 hours a day in the patient's home or a substantially equivalent environment. So we could see home health uh, care services being provided in an assisted living uh, or in a continuing a community, a residential community, or in a residential care home. Assisted living services is a little bit different. I won't complicate our presentation for today. And uh, they do provide home health aid services, physical therapy, speech therapy, the whole continuum of allied health, and it does include medical social services. Uh, the agency does provide professional nursing services and we refer to it at DPH as nursing plus one. That's how we define a home health care agency. So if they have at the very root professional nursing services and then one additional service, mm -hmm. such as I previously mentioned, the allied health services or medical social services, then they qualify as a home health care agency. Um, home, health age, home health aid agencies uh, are public or private organizations, and they provide, again, in the patient's home or substantially equivalent environment supportive care. Um, and it is not limited to uh, assistance with all activities of daily living. It can include incidental household tasks that are essential for that individual and family management supportive services. And key to this is that it's provided under the supervision of a registered nurse. And again, the services will be provided by a social worker or an allied health uh, person from the healthcare sector. And then healthcare, home health aid services is defined as you see. And hospice agency, again, is services that are provided to individuals that are at their end of life uh, or terminally ill patients. Thank you, Jill. Um, important to note that home health agencies are a medical model. Uh, they do provide services that support individuals with services that will hopefully with the end goal of keeping them in the least restrictive environment, which, which is, in this case is their home. Um, an example is assistance with grooming, bathing, and medication management or management of their disease process. Uh, key to our discussions and key to um, the CMS certified world is that they must have a need for skilled nursing services in addition to services provided by the home health aid occupational therapy, PT, or speech therapy. And here's, here's what we refer to as nursing plus one. Uh, home health care agencies are licensed by the Department of Public Health, and they are also certified by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So they must follow the regulations of the Connecticut state agencies, and they must also follow 
uh, the Code of Federal Regulations within the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services regulations and conditions of participation. Uh, cases are supervised by a supervisor of clinical services, always a nurse, and care plan treatment plans are developed based on that individual's profile. They are person-centered and they are reviewed with a scheduled frequency. Unlike a homemaker companion agency, uh, home health aides provide care to the patients, such as reading um, and recording temperatures, doing pulses, respirations, and they also support activities of daily living. They are trained to recognize uh, changes in an individual's presentation, but I do want to underscore here, they do not assess. They only collect data and then they pass that on to the registered nurse. And an individual working in a home health care agency is required to have a state and federal background check. And we have put the reference in Connecticut general statutes. So home care agencies are included in the definition and the federal de definition of a long-term care provider and a long-term care direct care worker. Thanks, Jill. If we can go on to the next slide, please. Um, they have a very structured set of regulations. Um, on the state side, I just included uh, some excerpts from the regulations that just would demonstrate that they are a formally structured and regulated community. Uh, they have governance that includes regulations that speak to the administrator the qualifications of the administrator, the responsibilities associated with that role. They have a formally established professional advisory council. They have requirements that they must have a supervisor of clinical services that provides supervision based on staff and client ratios. Uh, there are specific requirements for nursing services therapy services, social services, patient care policies, and what I always consider, and this is me saying it, um, not a representation, but patient treatment plans are critically important and very structured in the regulations, and they guide the care, the provision of care for that individual. Next slide, please. So we have appreciated over the years, and I, I use the royal we, it hasn't always been me, uh, and we have worked with Pam Brown for a long time, and we've appreciated that relationship uh, with DCP and DPH. So there's been a bit of a partnership, and there is an intersection with the work that each of us does. Um, here's the definition of a homemaker, home health aide, and it is an unlicensed person who does have formalized training, and they must have competency evaluations done by the agency. Um, we have done joint reviews and investigations with DCP when there has been a suggestion of the entity exceeding their authority or scope. Um, those things come to our attention often by family members who may reach out to us, or we may see it on a website or in social media that this uh, home care, homemaker companion agency is providing skilled nursing services. So we have partnered with DCP on those investigations. Uh, we haven't done anything like that, I think, since pre-COVID, uh, but we do have that history and we've appreciated that. Um, and Jill, I'm gonna pass to you. Um, so DPH did a dive into homemaker companion licensing, and that should also say home health licensing. Um, we found out there are 14 states that do not have oversight over homemaker companion agencies or home health agencies, uh, and Massachusetts and Vermont are included on this. Um, of the states that do not require a license, uh, part of their regulations require them to uh, be in compliance with the CMS um, conditions of participation. So those are a minimum set of rules 
for these type of facilities. And um, uh, so we consider them minimum qualifications. DPH uh, many times goes beyond what uh, the minimum federal qualifications call for. Um, and, uh, you know, we didn't do all 50 states review, but we did do some of them. Uh, we did find that for the most part, um, based on probably a review of 30 states, the licensing agency that licenses the home health agency is also going to license the homemaker companion agency. Uh, they have a two-tiered licensing system. Many of them are called home care agencies and not necessarily homemaker companion. Um, don't know if that's a term of art out in the community. Um, they, most of the agencies are required to have a qualified um, executive director and that uh, varies from a high school diploma and GED or uh, a nurse or a physician. Um, they, if you're doing both home health and homemaker companion, you are required to follow the CMS rules in order to be paid. Um, but um, homemaker companion agencies don't have CMS conditions of participation. So um, thankfully we rely on our sister state agency, DCP, to be able to keep up with um, what the requirements are for homemaker companion. Um, and, and the fees, the licensing fees range from $800 to $2,000. So that was um, different. Uh, the, the, the range was so vast <laughs> by each state. Um, and, you know, happy to do any further information reviews if you're looking for something in particular. Um, but this was the basic information. Um, and then our last slide is, um, you know, it, there's been sort of discussions in the background about DPH licensing homemaker companion agencies uh, with all the state retirements this year. Our FLIS staff has experienced a 48% reduction in staff due to retirements. Um, so we're working to get our program fully staffed um, before we could even think about taking on something of, of the vast 900 facilities that are out there. Um, we currently license 2,000 facilities um, for applications, inspections, complaint investigations, et cetera, with our staff. And... Um, so basically this would double our caseload, um, which would require a new team of individuals. Uh, Barbara, do you have anything you wanna add? Uh, the, the only thing I would, I would add to that, so Jill, thank you for that, is our current team, just to give you some context, uh, that monitors our home healthcare agencies is comprised of one supervisor and we have five individuals currently there with one vacancy. Um, we do have upwards of um, plus or minus five or 10 home care, 100 home care agencies. Uh, and we do receive upwards of 50 complaints a year. The survey process for the home care agencies uh, usually takes two or three people uh, and it could be three or four days, the duration of a survey because of the uh, they're looking at, they're wearing their federal hat and they are wearing their state hat. So they're looking at two separate sets of regulations. But I wanted to give context uh, regarding the work of what happens with a home health care agency. Thanks, Jill. Thank you. All right, thank you, ladies. Um, I guess we can open it up to any questions. Sheldon, I saw you had your hand up. Um, actually, Ann had her hand up first, but I'm going to oh. ask. To, I'm going to ask to go had. anyway because I have to leave, unfortunately, in about ten minutes. So I'm going to, if Ann would be so kind as to let me ask my question first. 
Totally fine, Sheldon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so it was interesting when, um, the, thanks for the presentation, by the way, all of you, uh, it's really been great. Um, the presentation suggesting that other states, that it's the same agency regulates the homemaker agencies and the home health agencies as we've sort of been defining it. Um, I totally get obviously the resource issue. <laughs> it's like, there's no question, massive resource issue. And no matter where, who is responsible for this, they have to have adequate resources. And if DPH doesn't have adequate resources to do what it's already supposed to do, that's another problem that needs to be outside the scope of our group, but has to be addressed. But putting that aside, is there, can you identify any pluses or minuses of having it be the same agency, whatever their name, um, uh, taking complaints, regulating both kinds of agencies? It sounds like there's some, because of this overlap thing and unclear definitions and stuff, that there might be some benefits to having it just be the same agency, whoever it is. But could you, you know, do you, do you have thoughts about that or what you've seen from other states? I would say for consistency purposes, uh, less confusion as to what your scope of uh, services that you can provide, you know, that one agency could help you rather than coming to one agency and having them send you to another agency. Barbara, do you have anything? No, I, I think it it's consumer oriented in that fashion. It's one stop shopping. Um, I think you've captured it perfectly, Jill, but the, the resource issue, and I don't want to belabor that, truly don't want to belabor it, um, is what would be a little bit of a gap for us right now at GPH. But certainly, certainly appreciate the concept. Yes. I think our sister state agency could use some help also. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't I don't mean to to suggest that we are the only state agency that is yeah. experiencing resource issues, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, as evidenced by, I'm back on a TWR. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. That, that's uh, absolutely, I do not want to in any way <laughs> suggest there isn't a serious problem and that if we're at DPH, you were given more responsibility, even more of a problem that has to be addressed. We're just saying in, in the ideal world, if, if that weren't a problem, what's the ideal as far as, you know, mm -hmm. they'll have it combined or not. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so I, I have a few questions, um, but first I did want to ask, uh, we're being asked if the presentations will be um, available afterwards. So if if both agencies could um, send their presentations to Cameron, he can post them on the, uh, on the website. That would be helpful. These are both really helpful presentations. Um, I, I was struck by the, um, the number of complaints um, that you receive for um, home health care agencies. Um, and I'm wondering if you have a sense um, the, the way DCP did about whether there are complaints that are coming to you that are about business processes as well as health and safety, or are they all health and safety related? Um, I, I would uh, I would say this, Anne, that there are some regarding business processes, but that's a small number. Um, without going in and looking and analyzing the allegations, um, they're typically focused on something went wrong with the treatment plan. So they really are focused, they have a medical focus and that the range could be any, you know, when I look back over the last couple of years, and certainly COVID was not good to any of us. Um, the number increased a little bit with COVID. So the range has been anywhere from 30 complaints a year to about 50 complaints a year. And in some of those cases, I heard um, there, there were questions about enforcement disciplinary action that can be taken. And we are fortunate in that we have uh, the CMS regulations as well. And we also have our state regulations and Connecticut general statutes gives us 
some enforcement ability or disciplinary action that we can take. So in some of those cases, we have had to take some uh, significant actions because there were significant concerns with quality and safe care. Okay, so where does a consumer go if they're a client of a home health care agency and they are um, they're overbilled and they say, you know, look, you, you know, you said you were going to charge me this much an hour and you're charging me, you know, three times that or you're, you, you know, these are charges that I'm um, not responsible for. That's not DPH, but I'm assuming that on the homemaker companion side, those those are the kinds of complaints that that they're getting, I'm guessing. Um, and so we're, um, what happens to home healthcare clients that have those kinds of complaints? So we, we sometimes get those complaints. Um, we might look at it um, while we were out on survey to see what the billing practices were like. Um, we also, uh, depending on the situation, the individualized situation, we might make a referral to the healthcare advocate's office or to the Department of Insurance. Um, yes, we uh, might make a referral to consumer protection. So we will refer when it doesn't stay or when we don't have when we are not the authority with jurisdiction. Okay. I think I'll stop there and, and see if other folks have questions. No further questions. I do have I do yeah. have a couple more, so I can <laughs> I can ask them, but I don't want to hog all. <laughs> can you please can you please explain um, uh, uh, authority versus obligation to discipline? So authority is what DPH can do in response to in response to a outcome that's been identified either through a survey activity or a complaint investigation. So if we should identify a significant lapse in care, um, we could reach out, would reach out. Uh, CMS will, so that the entity would receive two different notices of non-compliance. One representing, if they're a certified entity, let me be clear about that. Most home health care agencies are certified. So if they are certified, after our inspection activity, we would send out on behalf of CMS a federal notification that you violated these federal regulations. And then shortly thereafter, a second correspondence would go out indicating that you have violated the regulations of the Connecticut State Agencies or Public Health Code as we refer to it at DPH. It does require in both of those situations that the entity or the home health care agency in this, this situation respond with a plan of correction. So what is it that they are going to do? The overarching uh, thing that we want to see is what are they going to do to mitigate recurrence of this happening again? What are they doing in terms of auditing to make sure it doesn't happen again? And what did they do for the individual or individuals that were affected um, to make it right, to correct the issue with noncompliance? Um, so we receive those plans of corrections. We look at them, review them, approve them, and then we assess that they've actually done what they said they were going to do. Um, in certain situations, when there is significant failure, uh, we can work with the attorney general's office and execute a consent order. Uh, and it would be an order between the department and the entity, in this case, the home health care agency, directing them to do A, B, C, and D. 
Um, on the federal side, there are other enforcement activities that can happen. Uh, CMS could potentially fine a home care agency for significant noncompliance. Uh, there could be other uh, enforcement or disciplinary actions that CMS could take as well that could be up to and including termination from the Medicare program. I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you very much, Barbara. I would jump in with just one more question. Um, when you were going over the different levels of home care, home health care agencies, I'm trying to visualize how many home health agencies we might have, because I think you define that as having services similar to ours, but supervised by a nurse and maybe not the other therapeutic, uh, the, you know, the skilled, um, therapist OTPT that you mentioned. So I'm just not sure. Are there a lot of those in Connecticut? Um, I, I'd have to check. I think it's, it hovers around 20, but I, I want to check. I don't want to really give you that concrete number. I will, I will get that absolute number and give it to Ian. Just curious. And then it kind of leads to, would you say that most of the entities you're um, supervising they're medical, so they probably work yes. with medical insurance companies. Are any of them private pay, or they might have a separate? Um, because most of us are private pay. So, would would you, these medical entities offer private pay in addition? I guess. Yes, the, the short answer is yes. Um, most individuals, though, are covered by commercial or private insurance or Medicaid right. or Medicare. Um, they're are some private pay situations. I I don't think that's very common um, because the services are, are I suspect, and I, I have not seen a an inventory of, of prices, but I suspect the, the costs are high. Um, but private pay is certainly certainly an option and I'm sure one that's welcomed. I'm sure that might have to do with why there aren't so many billing um, and those types of, you know, issues yes. that come up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thanks. And I, uh, and Barbara, thank you for um, looking into how many, I think it was home health aid agencies. Yep. Is that what you're gonna, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, if you get that to Cameron, not me, then he can make okay. sure that every, everybody gets it. <laughs> okay. Um, um, but I, I had a question for Jill about the um, the other states. Um, you mentioned that um, 14 don't license, you know, either home care or, or uh, homemaker companion or whatever they call it in, in those states, but so, you know, similar to what we call homemaker companion here. Um, so, so 36 either license or have oversight. Do you have do you have it broken down by how many license and 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 if it's oversight, I may have missed. It is some kind of CMS oversight or is it state level oversight or can you just go through that again? So, if they don't require a license, they do require CMS oversight in order to get paid for Medicare Medicaid patients. Um. For home health agencies, and I did not find anything in those states where there's a homemaker companion, maybe like a secretary of state type registry as a business, but um, no official license um, or, you know, requirements for staffing, et cetera. Okay, so now now I'm I'm sorry I'm more confused, um, because I thought we were kind of putting home health aside in terms of yeah. looking at what other states are do are, are doing and just looking at like you know homemaker companion or you know home care or whatever they call it in the other yeah. states. Yeah, so those states um, that don't license homemaker companion home care. Uh, whatever they're calling them. Um, I did not find any type of, it was hard. 
it took many hours to even find a small bit of information, looking at applications, looking like there was no direct line to their regulations and statutes and requirements for um, for many of the states. So, um, you know, I th there was one organization that I was able to look at uh, that would do the license for you if you wanted them, pay them. But, um, <laughs> and their list was kind of helpful, but um, which which helped me dive further into it. But yeah, I, I did not see any type of, in 13 states, basically it was no Department of Public Health or Department of Health licensing, because some departments of public health in other states are combined with their Department of Social Services, and they have a separate licensing bureau for healthcare facilities and, and organizations of the like, and, and uh, practitioners and that kind of stuff, where they only do licensing. So all but either 13 or 14 um, have some kind of public health type oversight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yep. I have a, just a, probably a simple question. Um, obviously, Connecticut non-medical home care requires zero credit accreditation. Um, I believe New Jersey is the only state in the country uh, that requires accreditation to obtain a license here, a license. Um, the question is, and I'm pretty sure it's all of them. So all 2000 uh, home health agencies in Connecticut require accreditation, each and every one, whether, whatever they may they be. They require I certification. So if you want to accept payment, for Medicare, you have to follow the conditions of participation. You have to be, you have to, and DPH is the entity that uh, goes out and does inspections on behalf of CMS. So Centers for Medicaid and Medicaid, Medicare Services has their own list of conditions of participation. And then, um, CMS, so then DPH, when we go out, we look for Connecticut and um, from CMS. CMS may direct us to go out to a facility because they've heard about something. Um, or we may, if we go out and the, the agency is uh, a, really not a, doing well, um, we will notify CMS to let them know. And so, so, Part two of that is if you do have an accreditation, uh, you can delay your licensure inspection for a year. So, um, to narrow, so it's, okay. instead of two years, it's three years. To narrow it down, skilled agencies, home health agencies, they mm -hmm. do not require accreditation, you know, like through CHAP or the Joint Commission. No, huh? They don't. No, no. It's, it's and, entirely and, up to them. Mm -hmm. And just to correct that, it's it's 2000 total that, excuse me, total that DPH does across our sector. We right. have about a hundred home healthcare agencies okay. and there is a bonus for them in terms of accreditation. And if they are, if they have accreditation, then the accrediting organization does their certification survey on behalf of CMS. So they would only have the, mm -hmm licensure visit by DPH, and it would be that one set of regulations. So there is a incentive uh, for accreditation. Um, in, in addition to that, that endorsement, that gold seal of approval that AOs bring, um, but it's not required in Connecticut. But it is required in how many other states? Well, New Jersey is the only state that requires accreditation for uh, non-medical, non-medical homemakers and companions. Oh, okay. Yes. But other states have licensing of 
of those agencies. Most other states. Yep. Okay. And I really I did not see anything about accreditation except for, like you said, in New Jersey, um, for homemaker companion or um home health. Did somebody ask a question on uh, the number of um, agencies licensed under that home health aid uh, category? I'm going to get that number. I think it's zero. I wanted to say, I know there's one or there was. Uh, well, yeah, and I don't think it's, I, I think there's maybe one and I don't know if they're active. So, because I know I did some research on that. I've looked at this issue before yeah. around licensure and that was one of the places I ended up. Um, and where that um, regulation emerged from, I'm still a little confused, but <laughs> it looks to me like it was um, originally to govern, you know, maybe home care health agencies that wanted to do some of this uh, health aid work, some of the non-nursing related care, but it still, it still looks as it's like it's, you know, still dealing with, and I think your definition says some of that nursing directed care because otherwise you wouldn't need a nurse and when I went to when I was looking at that regulation the, the one thing that makes it really uh, not feasible for our industry is there's you need one RN for every 25 um, caregivers right mm -hmm. so we're not even doing nursing care so you know it, it's just it would be absolutely not affordable to have a, an RN managing 25 non-medical caregivers. Um, so that's that's probably right. one reason why we didn't fit in that. So if, if we were to kind of look at, I mean, you know, putting aside the question of budgets and where this, you know, where this should be housed, I guess, um, you know, you, you if you were looking at some form of licensure, you would you'd really have to, I'm not saying start from scratch, but there are really no existing regs that, that fit it other than, Really, what's under the uh, homemaker companion today is probably the place to start. You could use, you know, data points from other states, um, which I'm trying to pull together for us from um, our national agency. But, um, but yeah, there's not there's not much activity of any going on in that home health aid uh, agency category. I'm I'm going to check with our program people as well to see what it looks like to them on the ground. So I'll report back. And I'll send it to Cameron. Excellent. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions for Jill and Barbara? Um, all right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I think um, both presentations were, were really useful. I think it was great having them on the same day because there's a lot of overlap. Um, and I, and I understand all the points about confusion and that sort of thing. Um, but thanks everyone who did spend the time to prepare uh, and present today. We really appreciate it. Um, our next meeting is Friday, November 4th at noon via Zoom and YouTube. And that is gonna be our public hearing. And um, Cameron, I think you were saying that we were gonna be able to sign people up for that starting after this meeting. Um, if you're still around, are you with us? Yeah. 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 The, so they uh, can go, will, go the ahead. public will go to the um, aging committee page and then the task force. That is correct. And, and there will be a, there will be a Zoom sign up link on the Homemaker Companion page of the aging committee to sign up for this. It should also be in the coming bulletin. Okay. And that's how it will be advertised. All right, so that's uh, November 4th at noon. Anne, is there anything uh, I missed or that you wanted to say? No, I just wanted to uh, uh, reiterate what you said and uh, thanking the agencies uh, for doing these presentations. I know it's a lot of work um, uh, to do that. Um, and, and I think that it was really valuable information for this task force, so uh, we appreciate it. All right. 
Thank you, everyone. We'll see you on the fourth. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you.